Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third session of our webinar series, The Ukraine Crisis, Building a Just and Peaceful World. Today, it's Wednesday, March 9th, and our guests are Medina Benjamin and Marjorie Cohn. Eric Sperling, who was due to be with us, got caught in an airport, so we'll be hoping to schedule him again, maybe next Monday. I'll give Medea and Marjorie more complete introductions very soon. But for now, let me hand over to my co-host, the distinguished international jurist, Richard Falk. Uh, thank you, Helena. It's a real pleasure to welcome Medea and Marjorie to our third session. And I very much look forward to their illuminating insights, which I'm sure are going to follow these remarks. Let me stop there. Thanks, Richard. Today's webinar is the third of a planned eight sessions. In the two earlier sessions, Richard and I had extremely rich conversations that involved BJ Prashad, the military expert Lyle Goldstein, Ambassador Chaz Freeman, and nation publisher Katrina van den Heuvel. You can see the video of those sessions, today's session, and a lot more information about this project at our website, www.justworldeducational.org. Today's conversation will be fairly free-flowing and is projected to last roughly 45 minutes. After that, there'll be a chance for questions from the attendees which we ask you to put into the Q&A box. Also, amidst these emotionally taxing times, we want to request civility from all attendees, both in the chat box, and if you're invited to be on air, on air as well. So now it's my huge pleasure to introduce, to give bigger introductions to our two guests. Medea Benjamin is the co-founder of both the women-led peace group Code Pink, and the human rights group Global Exchange. She's the author of numerous articles and 10 books, including Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control, and Kingdom of the Unjust, Behind the US-Saudi Connection. Her most recent book, Inside Iran, is part of a continuing campaign to prevent a war with Iran and to promote normal trade and diplomatic relations. Medea, great to have you with us. Uh, you might want to unmute. Nice to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, Marjorie Cohen, who um, has been with our programs before, is a professor emerita at Thomas Jefferson School of Law, where she taught from 1991 through 2016. And she's a former president of the National Lawyers Guild. Cohen currently lectures, writes, and provides commentary for local, regional, national, and international media outlets. She has edited and also contributed to anthologies on the United States and torture and the ethical and political issues around the use of military drones. And she's the author, sole author of a number of other relevant books on international affairs. So Marjorie, once again, I think you're with us from the West Coast, is that right? That is correct. Thank you so much, Helene. And I'm just delighted and honored to be here with Richard and Medea and you. <laughs> well, great. I would like to jump right in and ask you to provide your take on either the priorities for the peace and justice movement, movement globally and in the US, or on the international law context of Russia's inv invasion of Ukraine? Yes, um, Russia is currently waging a war of aggression in Ukraine, and I'm gonna talk about that, but I also wanna say that it's very important to put that in context of the history since the fall of the Soviet Union, the role of NATO, the involvement of the United States in the 2014 coup, uh, et cetera. So I, I, I wanna qualify that, but nevertheless, Russia is violating the UN Charter, which says very specifically that countries cannot use military force against other countries unless they are acting in self-defense after an armed attack or with the permission of the Security Council. Neither of those things 
um, is the case here. Now, the Security Council has the primary responsibility under the UN Charter to maintain international peace and security. The Security Council did meet and there was a draft resolution, but Russia as one of the permanent members of the Security Council vetoed that resolution. So the General Assembly took up the matter under the Uniting for Peace resolution, which says that if the Security Council is deadlocked, the General Assembly can take action to restore international peace and security. And the General Assembly met and um, overwhelmingly, and, and let me just say this, the General Assembly is the democratic arm of the United Nations system. There are 193 countries. Um, and so overwhelmingly, the General Assembly passed a resolution calling on uh, Russia to cease its aggression, to um, immediately initiate a ceasefire, withdraw all military forces, um, and also called on all the parties to enforce the Minsk agreements, which I'm sure we'll be talking about later, um, and protect civilians in, and uh, abide by international humanitarian law, which is, of course, the protection of civilians primarily, and to submit to um, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic, well, diplomacy to settle the conflict. Um, now, do you want me to go into some of the background and the context, the political context at this point, or should we talk about that a little bit later? Um, I think talking about that a little bit later would be good. I mean, your um, explanation of the kind of the international law context of this is really valuable. Um, I don't know if, Medea, would you like to jump into that and, and talk about how international law affects what grassroots activists should be doing here? Well, as... Um... Uh, Marjorie and Richard know well, uh, the U.S. has not been a great uh, compliance with the uh, international law and really uh, creates its own idea of what the rule of law should be uh, and its might makes right. And so it's very hard in this context. We certainly want to condemn Russia for violating international law, uh, but also want to bring up the many times that the US has violated international law. I think it's quite ironic to hear not only people like Condoleezza Rice and uh, others saying that it's a war crime just to invade another country, uh, but we also hear members of Congress and people in the administration saying, we've got to take the uh, Putin to the International Criminal Court, something that the US uh, is not even a party to, uh, and uh, sanctioned key members of the International Criminal Court when it even wanted to look into possible war crimes that uh, the US might have committed in Afghanistan. Uh, so there's a lot of hypocrisy uh, in this. But I, I don't know if it's too big a jump, uh, but I did wanna talk from the perspective of the grassroots because uh, Marjorie, uh, we have to uh, start out everything by saying Russia invaded in a totally illegal move, uh, uh, horrific what it is doing, our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine. Uh, the issue for a lot of people in, uh, that would have considered themselves part of a peace movement uh, becomes how much do you put the emphasis on the NATO uh, as a provocation. And that has really divided the small peace movement that we have. You know, in the uh, lead up to the Iraq war and during those years, we had a huge peace movement, uh, people coming out by the hundreds of thousands to protest and globally by the millions. Um, this time around, uh, we called for people in the US in, on February 26th to come out and protest a, uh, 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 the, this um, crisis in Ukraine. And we got about 75 cities doing protests, small protests. Uh, we joined up then with our friends in the UK, the Stop the War Coalition, uh, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, and the No to NATO Coalition, which is an ongoing coalition that we uh, as Code Pink have been working with for years and uh, doing counter summits at all of their summits uh, year after year. And we came together and formed a Peace in Ukraine group. Uh, we called for global protest last Sunday, March 6th, 
we had them in about 150 cities, uh, in some cities quite large, in most places small. But there are, as you know, large protests against the Russian invasion uh, that have been called by the Ukrainian community in the diaspora here in the United States, quite large ones in many cities. I've been going to down to the White House and uh, it is difficult for uh, people who do want to add, uh, in addition to Russian troops out, ceasefire now, uh, a call for no expansion of NATO, uh, because we actually get attacked when we go to some of these other rallies, uh, because they're calling for more military intervention, um, uh, no fly zones. Uh, and they have signs saying, you know, thank you, NATO, we need more uh, intervention. I have a friend in Santa Cruz who just wrote to me and said, uh, this was the first pro-war peace rally I've ever been to. <laughs> uh, and um, so it has been very difficult. Uh, we have gone, uh, some of our Code Pink people with our normal messages down to the White House and had long conversations uh, with some of the Ukrainian Americans. And we understand where they're coming from. Their loved ones are being killed. They're being displaced. They're, um, they're, they're terrified. Um, and we try to argue that more war is not the answer and how horrific it would be if this became a, even, an even wider war. Uh, and we know that there is the uh, pending possibility of even a nuclear war. Uh, but when your family is being attacked and displaced, uh, of course, you're thinking of the more immediate. And so it's been difficult. Uh, it's also difficult for those of us who have been opposed to NATO for many years um, to educate people about that uh, history of NATO. We hear ad nauseum that NATO is a defensive alliance. And um, we know that NATO is an aggressive alliance, that it has been, even in its most recent history, aggressive in the case of Afghanistan, supporting the US in the case of Iraq, uh, um, being on the aggression side in the case of Libya. But what we're hearing from the news media is this constant, constant refrain of NATO being defensive. And so it is hard to educate people about the real history of NATO and why uh, this moment now when NATO is gaining new uh, status uh, is actually very dangerous in the long term. We see that the divisions that existed in NATO for the time being right now have vanished. Uh, thanks to Putin, NATO now has a new purpose. And uh, uh, all of the haranguing that the US has done, uh, especially under Trump, uh, but um, now under Biden as well, of, of calling on NATO countries to spend more on their military uh, has now um, become reality with all of the NATO countries um, quickly approving more money for their militaries. You know, it's a strange alliance when one of the goals is that you would increase your military spending to 2% of your gross domestic product, but that is indeed one of the goals of NATO, and uh, now they will be achieving that goal. And the last thing I want to say in terms of how difficult this is for the um, building of a peace movement is that so much of the efforts of the anti-war uh, groups has been to try to cut the Pentagon budget. And we've built up a strong alliance in the last year uh, on the back of the disaster in Afghanistan when it was Biden himself who revealed to the American people that we were spending $300 million a day every day for 20 years on war in Afghanistan, uh, making people really start to question, wait, why were we doing that? And uh, isn't this time then to move some of that money into the uh, real needs of people to deal with COVID and healthcare, the climate crisis, uh, student debt relief. And we had moved into uh, working with other larger movements 
for uh, addressing the climate crisis and issues like Medicare for all to bring the Pentagon uh, cuts issue into their movement and have been doing that quite successfully. And we see with a large faith-based movement like the Poor People's Campaign that the issue of cutting the Pentagon budget has been uh, quite front and center in one of their demands. And I until, thought we were, until now, <laughs> until now. And so I thought, you know, this coming year was the year to, uh, for us to have a little bit of success. You know, even if it was cutting the Pentagon budget by 1%, anything that would start us in the right direction. And so suddenly we're already seeing expedited calls uh, for more money for the Pentagon, uh, $14 billion uh, being added now to a must pass uh, budget that will be done by Friday, um, and the Democrats and the Republicans coming together to say uh, we must give more money to the Pentagon, more military aid to Ukraine. And so I feel like um, we have gone backwards so much in terms of uh, trying to call for a um, uh, uh, not only the cuts in the in the in the Pentagon budget, but demilitarization of our society in general, and then on a global scale with our friends in Europe, it's become very hard for them. So I think those are my opening remarks, and I look forward to the conversation. Great. Well, Richard, maybe you could come back. Good. Um, I I agree really with uh, everything that Marjorie and Medea have said, and I have said it very well, uh, I think that, that um, uh, Marjorie's emphasis on the degree to which uh, the crisis was provoked by NATO and US behavior is very important to keep in mind, that the, and that we always need to understand conflicts from the perspective of the other if we really have, if we really want to uh, understand them in a way that is uh, productive of a peace-oriented uh, perspective, and I think that that uh, that um, the other F emphasis that she, Marjorie, made on uh, the the uh, clarity of uh, Russia's violation of the prohibition on aggressive war, which is uh, the core provision of the UN Charter, needs uh, a little bit of clarification by reference to the Security Council. Because although there's clarity in the Charter, the design of the UN uh, enabled the five permanent members, which include, of course, Russia, uh, to uh, opt out of the obligations of the Charter whenever their strategic interests uh, collided. Uh, in other words, international law was deliberately subordinated to the primacy of geopolitics for the five most dangerous countries in the world. And uh, we shouldn't forget that because uh, the UN is not a legalistic institution. Uh, the General Assembly is state-centric and uh, favors the promotion of national interest, national sovereignty. But it has no decision-making, normal decision-making power. It only has the power to recommend and, to, and the International Court of Justice only has the power of advising, which really means that states, as well as these permanent members, have a broad uh, discretion not to comply with international law. And uh, this is, uh, I think, reinforced by the fact that uh, as Medea very uh, eloquently expressed it, uh, the US has set precedents 
for years, ever go, going back to the Vietnam War, for disregarding the aggressive uh, war prohibition and all that goes with it, including observing international humanitarian law, and has supported Israel over the years in its violations of uh, the elements of international law. Uh, and, and what's important to recognize is that there are two normative orders in uh, world society. The normative order associated with international law in which the norms are set uh, by agreement among sovereign states, uh, either through practice or through their explicit uh, treaty making uh, pro procedures. Whereas for the geopolitical norms, they are set by precedent. They're, they're not made by agreement. And therefore, the the precedent that the U.S. set are really quite uh, undermining of any kind of uh, righteous indignation about what uh, Russia has done. Uh, even though from a Westphalian international law point of view, it's a clear violation. And so one has this kind of tension a normative tension embedded in uh, international society. And it has been there ever since uh, the modern way of uh, states interacting has uh, existed. It preceded uh, the establishment of the UN. Uh, it it we used to talk about great powers and the substitution for great power and great powers exercise complete discretion over the use of force. Great powers have been uh, now replaced by the notion of uh, uh, P5 or the, the permanent five members, but not entirely. Because when you look really at the war peace issues, it's more a P2 or P3 world. It's, and, and uh, significantly, and this is my last observation, uh, Putin prior to the Ukraine invasion uh, said, uh, this, is, this will be the end of the unipolar world. And one should remember that at the end of the Cold War, a very triumphalist attitude uh, pervaded in uh, the US in particular, talking about the end of history, uh, talking about the enlargement of democracies, democracy promotion, all kinds of doctrines that justified or attempted to justify uh, intervention and regime change in far ignoring the sovereign rights of uh, members of the uh, international community. So that one way of looking at the, the broader implications of this crisis is to say it's about restoring spheres of influence as they existed in a bipolar world. In other words, where balance was the geopolitical norm, not, uh, not what it became after the Cold War, which was the US claiming to be a global security uh, power with its sphere of influence as wide as the planet. And, and uh, therefore, in justifying encroachments around the borders of its geopolitical rivals, China and uh, Russia. And this, uh, another geopolitical norm that was sacrificed in this process 
uh, was the idea of prudence and restraint. And it goes mm -hmm. to what uh, Medea was saying about uh, how does one balance the tragedy, the humanitarian tragedies against the risks and dangers of a wider war. And that points to the prudent, uh, the desirability of prudent behavior on the part of the geopolitical actor. One is really uh, vulnerable to their imprudence. And we're witnessing that both uh, on the part of Moscow and Washington. Let me stop there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Richard. I think, you know, this whole point about the US having aspired to a unipolar, like global governance role for itself is one that many Americans actually have internalized, that we think that the US is a, is a force for good. And we do only humanitarian interventions. And we overlook, you know, wars launched by Israel or, or Saudi Arabia or our allies. Um, but focus on, on our, our opponents. Um, and there's a lot of sort of, as, as we discussed on Monday with Chaz Freeman, righteous indignation against Russia right now and very little capacity for um, self-reflection. And there is evidently a humanitarian crisis of massive proportion in Ukraine. And we can't help but be you know, emotionally connected to those people and their suffering. But then what do we do with that? Do we say, oh, we have to have more and bigger weapons. We have to launch this, you know, no fly zone, which is actually a very, it sounds very innocuous, but as, as Medea and Code Pink have pointed out, a no fly zone is actually a very aggressive movement. But, you know, that's what Zelensky and many of his supporters are calling for. And, and the US is pumping weapons in there. So how do, how do we take this very emotional moment um, and try to put it in a, in a peacemaking context? Um, Marjorie, Medea, any ideas how we do that? I, I'd like to, uh, to, to just go back for a second, if, it's, if that's okay, Helene, and talk yeah. about the geopolitical context for what we're witnessing now, because we don't hear that in the corporate media. Um, we see these horrific images of displaced persons and civilians that are, are dying and the, this horrific war, but it's very important to really understand the historical context. And on February the 21st, the New York Times published an article on the front page, if you get the hard copy, above the fold, announcing that the United States is building a highly sensitive US military installation in Poland, just 100 miles from Russia's border, scheduled to begin operation this year. Um, and this is a site from which the United States could deploy nuclear armed missiles. Now, some of you may remember the Cuban Missile Crisis when Ru the Soviet Union had put uh, missiles, nuclear missiles in Cuba, 90 miles, not 100 miles. I, I, granted, it was only 10 miles less, uh, 90 miles from the border of the United States. And we came very close to a nuclear war at that point. Um, so it's, it's very important to put yourself, as Richard was saying, put yourself in the position of Russia, not to justify by any means Russia's violation of international law in launching this aggressive war. Um, and these, uh, Russia is surrounded by NATO countries and by um, missile deployments from NATO and from the United States, nuclear missiles um, that could wipe it out in a moment. Poland, Romania, um, the Baltics, the Black Sea, a, a clear threat to Russia. Now, as the USSR was breaking up in 1990, 1991, <clears throat> the US government promised the Soviet Union that it would not expand NATO eastward. 
Um, and uh, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev agreed in return not to oppose the reunification of Germany. Um, and yet by 1999, Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic had all joined NATO. Uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and Slovakia joined in 2004. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania followed suit. And that um, US foreign policy guru, George Kennan, uh, no radical he, uh, warned expanding NATO eastward would be the most fateful error of American policy in the Cold War era. Now, let me just say that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was formed as a defensive alliance against the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries. Um, it has never really functioned as a defensive alliance. It has fu functioned as an aggressive alliance. And as such, it violates the UN Charter. The UN Charter allows for regional arrangements for defensive purposes, not regional organizations for aggressive purposes. And US-led NATO, because the US does lead NATO, uh, the head of NATO is always a high US general, um, in, in illegally invaded uh, Belgrade in 1999, Iraq in 2002, Libya in 2011, Syria, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. Now, in 1997, dozens of foreign policy veterans, including former Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, um, sent a joint letter to then President Bill Clinton saying, quote, the current US-led effort to ex expand NATO would be a policy error of historic proportions. They were warned. In 2008, WikiLeaks, that critical organization uh, led by Julian Assange, who is now languishing in prison, facing 175 years in prison for revealing US war crimes. WikiLeaks leaked a cable from US ambassador to Moscow, William Burns, um, who is now the director of the CIA in the Biden administration. And that cable said that not only does Russia perceive encirclement and efforts to undermine its influence in the region, but also fears unpredictable and uncontrolled consequences, which would seriously affect Russian security interests. And Russia is particularly worried that the strong divisions in Ukraine over NATO membership could lead to a major split involving violence, a civil war, and Russia would have to decide whether to intervene, a decision Russia does not want to have to face. In 2014, the US facilitated uh, Victoria Nuland uh, at the time, who is now in the Biden administration again, uh, facilitated a coup overthrew a democratically elected president in Ukraine. Um, and, and, and that democratically elected president had resisted economic reforms that were sought by the International Monetary Fund to make Ukraine more enticing to investors, um, lowering wages, reducing the education and health sectors, um, which compromised most of, which, which was most of Ukrainian employment, cutting natural gas subsidies um, that facilitated affordable energy for Ukrainians. After the coup, not coincidentally, the new US-backed government cut heating subsidies in half, and in return, were rewarded with a $27 billion commitment from the IMF. Now, Putin was very clear in December of 2021 when he proposed two treaties, one between the Russian Federation and NATO, the other between the Russian Federation and the United States, basically calling on the West to halt NATO expansion, negotiate Ukrainian neutrality um, in the East-West rivalry, remove US nuclear weapons from non-proliferating countries, uh, and remove missiles, troops, and bases near Russia. The US thumbed its nose at those proposals. And it, 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 I'm not saying that uh, Russia was justified by any means in its invasion and aggression in Ukraine. But, there, but Russia has come to this point because Ru every step along the way, US-led NATO has refused to acknowledge Russia's real security concerns and how critical it is to Russia not to expand NATO 
to Ukraine. Um, and, and I want to say the reason for that is that Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, which is the founding document of NATO, says mm -hmm. that an attack on one NATO country uh, means that the other NATO countries would respond with military force. And the fact that Ukraine is not a NATO country, that's the reason why the US and other NATO uh, countries don't have troops right now in Ukraine, although they're sending, as Medea said, massive amounts of, of weapons. So I think it's very, very important understanding the legalities and what Russia is doing, violating the law, to put it into this geopolitical context so that we can understand going forward exactly um, what we need to do to change that. Thank you, Marjorie, that's really helpful. Um, I mean, I think it's very important for all, especially younger people these days to really learn about NATO because they, you know, when we were all coming up in the, at the end of the Cold War or during the Cold War, we knew what NATO was. Um, but people, especially in this country here in the United States don't really know what it is. They know it's something to do with Europe and it maybe is linked to the EU or something like that. But now, you know, we're all getting a crash course in what NATO is, and it's it's being portrayed as, you know, an essential shield for all of us in the West. And I think it's really important to note that NATO is a, a an embodiment of the West. It's kind of the West in arms. And therefore, you know, you need to look at, at the whole role of the West historically and currently in world affairs. Um, Medea or, or Richard, do you want to come in on that? Uh, can I make just a quick comment on NATO? It, I think one of the tragedies of the present is that NATO survived the end of the Cold War. It was really a Cold War uh, relic and should have been uh, disbanded. And we would have an entirely different world situation had that happened. And uh, why it didn't happen, why, you know, and the Kosovo War was partly uh, justified as a way of showing that NATO was needed even in a post-Cold War world. And that really distorted its initial pattern of justification. And I think uh, we should revisit that uh, failure to end NATO as part of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the disappearance of any justification for needing a defensive alliance of this sort for the protection of Europe. Can I just add there that um, the present situation has so strengthened NATO that even countries like Finland and Sweden are considering applying to NATO. And so instead of getting what the world needs, which is a disbanding of NATO, um, we are getting a reinforced NATO uh, with a lot more money that all of the NATO countries will be spending. And I did wanna go back to um, something that has been mentioned here about uh, that would be a, a terrible escalation of NATO and particularly the US role, uh, which is the no-fly zone. And I think we're at a very dangerous moment right now where Biden and uh, his advisors understand just how uh, dangerous it would be to in implement or try to implement a no-fly zone uh, and knowing that that would mean that the uh, US and NATO countries would have to be ready to shoot down Russian airplanes and how it, they would get them directly involved in the war with Russia. But the correlation of forces is a difficult one right now because even though the White House is saying, no, we don't want to go there, um, there is a clamor. Uh, it's an interesting division. Uh, there are a number of heavyweights in the uh, former uh, generals and, and others who came out and said, now is the time for a no-fly zone. Uh, there are uh, members of Congress like uh, Adam uh, uh, the, uh, um, Kinzinger, the um, Republican who is saying now is the time for a no-fly zone. 
Uh, there are others um, that are saying all options must be on the table. It is interesting that we have voices of reason coming from strange places like Senator Marco Rubio or um, the Senator Joni Ernst, a combat veteran herself, both saying uh, that this would lay the foundations for World War III. But what I'm hearing right now is a call for a limited no-fly zone. So they're trying to make it more specific. And this is such a slippery slope, which is why it is so important right now for us to be contacting the White House, contacting our Congress people and saying no to uh, this direct involvement of a no-fly zone. Because if those voices from Ukraine, like Zelensky, who is uh, seen as the modern day hero and uh, getting standing ovations in the, uh, when he addressed the, um, the, the British uh, uh, members of parliament, um, he is pushing for this. And I think there is just a lot of pressure on the White House right now. So that is something that scares me very much just as the um, uh, efforts right now to get these MiG jets into uh, Ukraine from Poland and the kind of behind the scenes trading of these weapons that are going on to make that happen. So my hope is that the talks that are going to be happening tomorrow in Turkey, uh, which is the highest level of talks, will actually push us in another direction. And Richard, when you're talking about Putin calling for this to sort of be the end of the unipolar uh, world, um, I guess he was thinking of Russia being in there, but what has really actually happened is giving more weight to China. And there is now uh, the calls coming from many quarters for China to be the peacemaker in this. Of course, we've heard about uh, the offering of services from Israel and Saudi Arabia as peacekeepers. <laughs> and I have to laugh at those offers, but I wouldn't um, put down the offer uh, or the possibility of China. And I think that would give China tremendous uh, prestige on the global scale uh, that would go along with its uh, um, incredible power as a, an economic force that has already been challenging uh, the United States. Russia is losing in all of this. No matter how it ends up, Russia is a loser. Um, they're going to lose economically tremendously by uh, all of the money being spent on this, all of the sanctions that will be very hard to undo even if this war ends quickly, uh, and in terms of just global prestige. So I do hope that there is some efforts, uh, significant and efforts underway inside Russia um, to hold Putin accountable for what he has done because it will really affect Russia for many years to come. Medea, can you imagine Washington accepting China as a mediating power precisely for the reasons you suggest that it would give them greatly enhanced geopolitical stature to do so. Yeah, it would be very we difficult to see the US agreeing to that. On the other hand, I do think there is a lot of fear in the White House about where this could go. And an understanding that, well, uh, Biden has gotten a bump in the polls from uh, the way he is seen as handling this, uh, that people don't wanna pay four, five, six, seven dollars at the gas pump uh, for uh, gas and, and that will have an impact in the polls as well. So I think that there is some desperation going on to figure out how to bring this to a close uh, in a way that will not, um, uh, that will of course, you know, hurt Russia, um, but will not take us into a wider war. It is very interesting to to see the role that China has played because at the opening on the opening day of the Olympics or right before the Olympics opened, um, uh, Xi and Putin met and issued a statement, basically a very mutually supportive statement, um, and and the. Uh, Security Council resolution that Russia vetoed was not vetoed by 
China. China abstained, and that is because it was crafted in a way to get support from China, taking it, taking uh, the uh, the resolution out of Chapter Seven of the UN Charter, which has to do with uh, ordering uh, military force and and putting it under Chapter Six, which is non-military force. Um, the U.S. has moved very deliberately from fighting this so-called gl uh, global war on terror, which it used as an excuse to uh, kill millions of people, torture thousands of people, uh, you know, uh, really take away many of our civil liberties, etc., uh, moving toward countering Russia and China. Um, and so I think that, that, uh, that Richard does, I think that both Medea and Richard um, have very important points here. China could play an important role in terms of uh, being a negotiator with, with uh, what's happening. And Zelensky is uh, open, at least it was reported by ABC, um, that Zelensky uh, has cooled down regarding NATO membership and he's open to discussions about control of the Russian-backed separatist regions in Eastern Ukraine. He's open to that. Um, so I, I think that we should not be overly pessimistic about the prospects uh, specs for diplomacy. Um, I think China has an important role to play, but Russia is going to have to see a much more balanced settlement, uh, diplomatic settlement than uh, has been seen already in the failed Security Council resolution and the um, General Assembly resolution that get, did go three, through. And that would have to include a, a ceasefire withdrawal, humanitarian aid, um, but also NATO would have to immediately cease its, um, its provocations, uh, no more military buildup, um, and uh, the base in uh, Poland, 100 miles from the border of, uh, of Russia, um, would, would, should not be opened. And interestingly, um, I don't know how many people get the hard copy of the New York Times, but since that was reported, that, that uh, American military base 100 miles from Russia, uh, on the front page of the New York Times on February 21st, it, there's been radio silence about it in the corporate media and almost no mention of it in the alternative media. Um, and, and yet I think it is the elephant in the room. It's emblematic of uh, the way Russia is feeling surrounded and threatened. So um, I just wanna come back to what we uh, discussed actually in our session on Monday where we did discuss the, uh, the prospect of a, a Chinese um, mediating role with Ambassador Freeman and, and um, Katrina Vanden Heuvel. And it, what we came up with was the idea that yes, China is in a unique position to, to do this, but maybe couldn't do it on its own without some kind of um, support from either the UN or the EU. Um, so, but undoubtedly, China has a new form of soft power in the world, which I'm hoping will become more relevant over the coming decades than raw military hard power. But we, you know, nothing is, nothing is guaranteed at this point. Um, and just one point about the no-fly zone, um, going back to what Medea was saying, um, you know, I think you just need to talk to the people of Libya about the way that the US and NATO exceeded their, the mandate they were given in the, by the Security Council to establish a no-fly zone, and they went for complete regime change and wrecked the entire country with no accountability, nobody being held accountable. Um, for those terrible decisions made by Hillary Clinton and others. Um, so, I, I mean, I think whenever we're talking about no fly zone and Code Pink has been doing a great job of doing this, do mention Libya because that, it, that, that, that's kind of the object lesson. Now we do have a couple of questions here. Oh, um, one person is asking, um, Donald Smith is asking, how can we draw attention to US responsibility for the crisis without leaving ourselves open to being accused of being Putin apologists? Um, maybe for you, Medea? 
Well, that is a very difficult thing. That's what uh, you know. I was trying to get across when we asked people to mobilize uh, in the streets or go to Congress. Um, uh, it, it's a um, it, it's a position that has to be very clearly stated from the beginning that we are absolutely opposed to the invasion and we call for Russian troops out. Uh, I think without starting from there, um, nobody's going to listen to us. And uh, then moving from there to talk about not only the great historical uh, summary that Marjorie gave us. Uh, but also in talking about why that's important today, because there will be no um, negotiated solution that Russia will agree to uh, if it doesn't include the issues not only about uh, Ukraine not getting into NATO, but also about uh, the way that NATO has uh, so much taken over so much of those uh, eastern, uh, the countries that are close to the eastern border. So. Um, I think we have to just uh, keep those two things uh, together. And um, it is important when we talk to uh, members of Congress uh, that um, the NATO, uh, the NATO uh, responsibility uh, is included because I'm already seeing, in fact, there was a piece in the New York Times that came out yesterday that talked about how uh, people who are running for office now are starting to backtrack from positions they might have once held uh, being uh, uh, more in the peace camp, um, but now being attacked so much by mostly the media, I would say, um, they are uh, strengthening their support for NATO, strengthening their support for a uh, very robust and, in, uh, and growing uh, Pentagon budget. And so mm -hmm. we have to be the counterweight to that uh, if we want to um, be, be both relevant and stick to our positions about this world being way, way, way too militarized. Yeah, it's a difficult thing to do, but um, I mean, I, we've many of us were attacked for being Saddam supporters back in the day, or Hamas supporters. You know, if you if you criticize a U.S. war, you're going to have all kinds of shit thrown at you. Um, pardon the uh, the French um, merde, I guess. So um, we have another question here um, from Kevin Gribrook. Gib I'm sorry if I mangled your name. Um, who says it seems as if people on both the left and right want to avoid the issue of the neo-Nazi factor in Russia's dis decision to in invade. Um, does either of you have, have something to say about that? Um, yes, there were documented neo-Nazi uh, forces that participated in the 2014 coup and have continued and, and are now part of the Ukrainian military to which the United States is giving you know, huge amounts of, of support. Um, and this is something that Putin has talked about and is poo-pooed in the, in the corporate media, but I wanna refer people to um, FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which is a very important source which analyzes the corporate media, the alternate media, and uh, and is is clear eyed and is very is independent and they have fair f a i r um, have documented these neo nazi forces. I'm not saying that neo nazis control the entire Ukrainian government, but there is a significant uh, significant presence of neo nazi forces um, in uh, in in uh, Ukraine, and that's what Putin is referring to. I just wrote yeah. a piece about this that I'm going to share uh, in the chat, if it's okay, um, that came out today. And uh, we go through the history of the US support for um, these neo-Nazi groups. And the conclusion is one I think is important because we compare it to uh, what happened with uh, US support for Al-Qaeda link groups in Syria 10 years ago and how we have ISIS today. And we end up saying we shouldn't be surprised if the US alliance with these neo-Nazi forces in Ukraine, including the infusion of billions of dollars in sophisticated weapons, 
uh, results in the future in some similarly violent uh, blowback. Yes, and um, Max Blumenthal has a piece at the Grey Zone recently in which he specifically looked at how Zelensky, who is being you know, presented as one of the, the world's two Jewish heads of, of state or government, how it was that Zelensky did a deal with the neo-Nazis early in his term. Um, so I think all of that is, is useful background. Um, I think Richard may have left us. He told us he had to, I hope he might come back, but just for all of you out there who are not seeing him on the screen right now, he may or may not come back, but it's not, he, he told us he would have to leave a little early anyway. Um, one last question here I'd like to ask, why is a democratic country like the United States imprisoning the publisher Julian Assange? Well, it's technically being done in England, but it's at the behest of our um, Democratic Party president and his attorney general. Why is that happening? And if so, why aren't the media letting the American people know what is going on? <laughs> Take yeah, it away. <laughs> I would like to answer that if I may. Um, in 2010, uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange had the gall to release uh, information that they had received from whistleblower Chelsea Manning that documented U.S. war crimes in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Guantanamo, and that is the basis for the charges now, the indictment against Julian Assange in the United States. Um, when the Obama administration looked, Obama administration, which prosecuted more whistleblowers than all prior presidents combined, um, convened a secret grand jury and considered indicting Julian Assange, they decided not to because of what has been become known as the New York Times problem, because WikiLeaks didn't do anything different than what the New York Times, the Washington Post, or Spiegel Le Monde did, which was to publish this information, which is what investigative journalism does. And so Obama didn't indict him. Along comes uh, Donald Trump, and Pompeo was very upset uh, about um, what happened in 2017, which is the WikiLeaks publication of secret CIA files about how they're surveilling uh, and, and secretly uh, electronic surveillance against us. So Pompeo was very upset, and that led to a secret indictment of Julian Assange uh, and calls for his extradition to the United States. Uh, but instead of following uh, the policy of his good friend Barack, uh, uh, whom uh, Biden likes to attach his coattails to frequently, um, Biden continued uh, Trump's uh, pr uh, attempt to get Julian Assange extradited to the United States. And there's an appeal now of denial of extradition that is being pursued by Biden. Julian Assange, as I said, is facing 175 years in prison for publishing those that evidence of U.S. war crimes. And yet we see, and, and as the, the uh, questioner said, almost no coverage at all of Julian Assange in the corporate media. We see coverage in other countries. We see coverage in the alternative media, um, but we see almost no coverage in the corporate media. And I urge people to go to assangedefense.org um, which is the premier organization in the in the U.S. that is uh, leading the fight to free Julian Assange. And it's not just this one man uh, whose future is at stake, who is in very, very frail health, thanks to his uh, abuse and psychological torture suffered in incarceration, um, but also the very future of investigative journalism, of national security journalism, of the First Amendment right to freedom of the press and freedom of expression. That's what's at stake here. So I think it's it's really critical that we support Julian Assange and put pressure in any way we can on our government to dismiss the extradition request, dismiss the appeal, and let him go free, and then commend him for his heroism and bravery. Thank you so much. That was so eloquent and um, true. Um, I'm afraid I, I, that our... 
Yeah. But I was yeah. just going to add one thing is that, you know, we see the importance of leaks now in this issue around Ukraine when we see the leaked phone call from Victoria Nuland to the U.S. ambassador <laughs> to Ukraine when she's plotting who's going to be the next head of Ukraine. You know, without that kind of information, um, we don't know the machinations of our government behind the scene, and it makes us very, it makes it very difficult to understand um, the politics. And so these kinds of leaks are absolutely essential. And I also just want to add that um, the media has been so bad in the United States in all of this. I feel like the, the media is egging on, uh, the White House is egging on the politicians, uh, is really pushing, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you cutting off all trade with Russia? Why aren't you sending them uh, the, the real weapons that they need? Uh, why aren't you creating this no-fly zone? And uh, it's, uh, it it's, uh, does such a disservice uh, to the complexity of this issue. And uh, I almost never do I hear the media saying, um, why aren't you, Biden, pushing harder for negotiations? Uh, why aren't you calling upon uh, this a leader or that leader or the other to uh, convince Putin to sit down and, and get serious about talks. Um, I mean, you don't see that kind of questioning. And so when you see like the State of the Union and you hear Biden, um, there's not a word about, and I'm going to do everything I can right now to make sure that negotiations happen right away and that they're successful and that there is going to be a ceasefire. Uh, no. Um, so I would say, you know, this is so related to Julian Assange and, and how much he uh, uh, did to educate us about um, the U.S. roles in Iraq and Afghanistan and how much we need uh, not only WikiLeaks, but whistleblowers to help us understand and try to affect our own government's policies. Yeah, I think just on the media thing, you know, if we go back to 2003 and remember the role of the New York Times and many of its journalists and editors in just like egging on the campaign against to invade Iraq. And where did that lead us? Where did that lead, you know, the American people or the Iraqi people or world peace? You know, this totally um, belligerent kind of America first journalism is not actually journalism as I practiced it for many years. I'm afraid that um, we're coming to the end of our time here. We've got a lot more to talk about. So we're glad that we're going to be continue to have two sessions per week with a revolving cast of guests here in this project through March 28th. And we hope our present guests will drop back in as you are able. Um, attendees can find details of the whole upcoming schedule at our website, www.justworldeducational.org. Um, next Monday, we're going to have Bill Fletcher Jun Jr., who's, who's a veteran um, African-American workers' rights and anti-war activist, and hopefully Eric Sperling, who was supposed to be with us today, or one of his colleagues. Um, we're not quite sure. And we have some more great guests. You can find details of all of them if you go to the link that's on the front page of our website. Um, you will also find a donate button on our website. All of this stuff, pulling together these wonderful people um, does cost a bit of money. Not that we're paying our guests, I have to say. So thank you for coming without honoraria or anything else, but just behind the scenes, you know, we do have, have bills to pay and such. And also for attendees, as you exit from, as you leave the, the webinar, there will be an exit poll and we really would like it if you could fill that out because the exit poll helps us plan our, our programming going forward. So now it's a, sort of a bittersweet moment for me to have to say goodbye to Marjorie Cohen and Medea Benjamin. Uh, both of you have just really helped us all understand these issues a whole lot better. Um, if either of you has a, a, a last three words to say, what should people do as they, as they, after they've left this webinar? I would encourage you to uh, sign up at codepink.org if you're not members, because every week we have a new action. Uh, we keep really up to the minute on what's going on and give you some uh, good direction in terms of what you can do to uh, work for peace. And thank you so much for, uh, for this opportunity.
And to Thanks. quote the great uh, Joe Hill, three words you said, don't mourn, organize. And that means <laughs> anything you can do, letters to the editor, peg them to a news story or an op-ed, keep them under 150 words. If yours doesn't get published, others from the same perspective will because they count up the letters. Call, write, email, text, barrage your congressional representatives, the White House, and tell them exactly what is going on and try to, to blunt some of that very one-sided coverage in, I don't want to say the media, it's not the media because we're also part of the media, it's the corporate media. It's not the alternative media, it's the corporate media, and we have to continue to refer to it as such because there are many people such as Medea and I who work in the alternative media who are getting the truth out. Um, so uh, don't more and organize. <laughs> Thank you both very much and see you and uh, all the attendees again soon, I hope.